Hello everyone, this is Dr. Vishal Trivedi from Department of Biosciences and Bioengineering, IIT Guwahati. And in the course Enzyme Science and Technology, we are discussing about the different aspects of the enzyme. And in the current module, we are discussing about the different types of uh, assays to measure the enzyme activity. So in this context, if you remember that we have said that the enzyme is playing a crucial role in running the anabolic reaction and as well as the catabolic reaction and both of these reactions are important for the survival of the host and uh, if you want to monitor the uh, anabolic reaction or the catabolic reaction you have to develop a suitable assay system so that you can be able to measure the activity of an enzyme. In this context, we have discussed so far, what we have discussed, we have discussed about the photometric assays and in the photometric assays, we have discussed about how you can be able to measure the uh, absorbance of the system and how you can be able to use that information to calculate the concentration of the substrate or the concentration of the product utilizing the Beer's Lambert law and then we can also be able to use the fluorometric assays where you can actually be able to use the fluorescent substrate or the fluorescent product and that's how you can be able to use the photometric assays. In today's lecture, we are going to discuss about the chromatographic, uh, uh, we are going to discuss about the radiometric assays and as well as the assays, how you can be able to perform the assay of an enzyme in the, uh, using the gel electrophoresis. So let's start discussing about the radiometric assays. So as the name suggests, the radioactic, radiometric assays mean the assays where you are actually going to use the radioactive uh, or radioactivity as the uh, as a monitoring uh, uh, substance, right? Just like as we were discussed about the photometric assays, we were discussing about the absorption and excitation and all those kind of phenomena. In the radiometric assays, you are actually going to measure the radioactive counts. And remember that the radioactive assays are uh, going to be done under the strict uh, guidance or the strict uh, rules and regulations so that you should not to have a radioactive wastage and as well as you should not have the radioactive spillage. And I have already discussed all these aspects, what are the different types of precautions you should take when you are going to do the radiometric assays in my another MOOC course called Experimental Biotechnology. So in that case, we have discussed about the different types of uh, precautions and other kinds of, uh, you know, the things what you should actually able to wear. So for example, when you are doing radiometric assays, you always have to have the radiometric, uh, uh, you know, radioactive batches, right? And you should also use the uh, lead walls and other kinds of sheets. And so that you should actually be able to protect yourself while you are doing radioactive assays. So as the name suggests, radiometric assays means you are actually going to use the radioactivity. So the radiometric or the radioactive enzyme assays which use the radioactivity labeled substrate have been used successfully for many years to measure a wide variety of enzyme activities. The application of radiometric assays were initially restricted because of the limitation in the commercial availability of suitable labeled substrate and the scintillation counting instruments. Radioactive enzyme assays have successfully been used for enzyme substrate labeling with the substrate like uh, tritium, uh, 14C, 32P, 33P, uh, 35S and I-125. So these are the radio labeled nuclei because they are actually going to give you the radioactivity and you can be able to make the substrate along with the either the tritium labeled hydrogen, uh, tritium labeled uh, 14C carbon, phosphorus and so on. Okay, so depending on what kind of uh, atoms are present in your substrate, you can be able to use either of these. The configuration of radioactive assay will in most cases be determined by a satisfactory quantity method of uh, separating the labeled product from the unreacted substrate. With homogeneous radiometric techniques such as scintillation proximity, this is not a longer a issue actually. Uh, so in one of the major chunk or major task of performing radiometric, radiometric assay is that you are actually going to have the separation of unreacted substrate from the uh, labeled substrate or the product. 
but with the help of the scintillation proximity assay system which we are actually going to discuss in this uh, particular lecture there is no need to verify actually radiometric assay has highly sensitive specific and absence of interference make them ideal for such high throughput screening applications uh, for the, in the pharmaceutical industry where there is a large and growing demand for the screening assay in the early stage of development so radiometric assays are very popular in the pharmaceutical industry where you would like to use these kind of assays in the high throughput screening to uh, screen the different types of inhibitors or drug like molecules when you are going to do the radiometric assays, you are actually going to use the uh, different types of uh, associated uh, techniques. So, radiometric assays are typically based on the conversion of radio label substrate to the labeled product. The availability of radio labeling substrate and a simple and rapid method of quantitatively separating the product from the unreacted substrate are the two major requirements of a radiometric enzyme assays. So, when you want to perform the radiometric assays, you are actually going to use all these assays or all these techniques. You are going to use the ion exchange techniques, you are going to use the precipitation, solvent extractions, paper and thin layer chromatography, electrophoretic method and as well as the scintillation proximity assays to purify the labeled product from the unreacted substrate. Because unreacted substrate is also radioactive your labeled product is also reactive, right? So that's why you are supposed to purify the labeled product. Uh, scintillation proximity assay. The scintillation proximity assay is a uh, assay where you are actually going to, where you have the beads and these beads or the scintillation proximity beads and these beads when they are, uh, you know, uh, receiving the beta particles from the radioactive material, they are actually going to give you the light, okay. In an ideal setting, when you want to do the radioactive measurements, what you are going to do is, you are actually going to uh, take the radioactive uh, active nuclei and put it into the scintillation cocktail and then you are actually going to put the vial into the beta counters or the gamma counters, depending on the type of radioactive nuclei what you have used. But in the case of scintillation proximity assay, you are actually going to have the SPA beads or scintillation proximity beads and these scintillation proximity beads when they are actually going to receive the beta particles from the radioactive nuclei, they are actually going to give you the light. And they, this uh, excitation of scintillation proximity assay, uh, scintillation proximity beads depends on the distance of these beta particles. So, it is actually going to give you a very specific signal. What is the application of the scintillation proximity assays to enzyme assays? So, SPA can be used to determine the catalytic action of the enzyme. The majority of the SPA enzyme assay uses the biotinylated substrate that can either be uh, immobilized or subsequently captured by the streptodyne coated SPA beads, right? So, you can have the SPA beads which is actually going to be coupled with streptodyne and uh, and you know that the streptodyne has a very strong affinity for biotin. So, uh, if you have the biotin on your substrate, as soon as the, uh, the substrate is going to be captured by the SPA beads, the SPA beads are actually going to start emitting the lights and that is how you can be able to quantitate that light and you can be able to calculate the concentration of the enzyme. Uh, you can actually be able to use the SPA based uh, uh, enzyme assays to measure the activity of hydrolases, transferases, polymerases, kinases and uh, the technique is applicable to the tritium level, uh, iodine 125, sulfur 35 and the phosphor 33 labeled substrate and optimization is required as with the other enzyme assays. The conversion of the substrate to the product is tackled by designing the assays to remove or add the radioactivity in relation to the component captured on the SPA beads. The process can either involve the removal of radioactivity by the enzyme resulting in a decrease in the SPA signal or the addition of radioactive resulting in the increase in the SPA signal. So, you can actually be just like as we discussed right either you can be able to measure the 
substrate concentration and you can actually be able to monitor the decrease in substrate concentration or you can be able to see the increase in product and then you can actually be able to see the so that's why the SPA beads can be uh, is, a, is a very convenient way of measuring the either the initial concentration of the substrate and then you will going to see the decrease in initial concentration of the substrate or you are going to see the increase in the concentration of the product. In all cases, the discrimination of the products on the substrate does not require the component to be separated and SPA is a homogeneous technique. This has the advantage in some instance that incomplete recovery or detection of the product is not an issue. When compared to the methods such as precipitation and filtration, SPA enzyme assay exhibit high precision and reversibility when a large number of sample must be analyzed in a short period of time, SPA is a very, very powerful technique. Then we, so this is what it is showing is that how you can be able to use, so either you are going to have the increase in uh, uh, the signal or you are going to have the decrease in signal. So the signal decrease assay format is appropriate for the hydrolytic enzyme that act on a single cleavage site on the substrate of the choice. The substrate is designed with a bead binding uh, site and a radio labeling site separated by an enzyme cleavage sequence. Most signal decrease assay can be designated as a solution phase or solid phase assay, but not all are solid phase compatible. For example, you can be able to use the SPA based uh, protease assay to measure the HI1 protease. Okay. Then we can also have the signal increase assay. So in a signal increase assay, you are going to first, uh, you know, this is, this is good for the transferases, polymerases and the capture format. Okay. So signal increase SPA format has been used uh, biotinylated acceptor molecule as a substrate for iodinylated or tissue labeled donor substrate. The number of assays for the DNA and RNA polymerases have been developed using the biotinylated DNA, DNA primers, DNA or RNA templates and the tissuated nucleoride. Given their appeal as a therapeutic target, the various assay methodology have been approached approaches for high volume screening of virus uh, polymerases and related proteins were recovered. For example, you can actually be able to use the SPA based transferase assay for the formicil transferase. So this is the assay what I am going to show. And uh, what you are going to do is you are going to take the substrate and then you are going to have the increase in signal which means you are actually going to measure the product. In the signal decrease assay you are going to measure the substrate. So substrate you are as the substrate is getting cleaved there will be a decrease in signal. Whereas in this case, there will be a transfer of the radioactivity onto the biotinylated substrate and that's how you are actually going to have the increase in product. Then we have the product capture assays. So in the product capture assays, what you are going to do is you are going to do a time course analysis of the phosphodiester SPA based assay. So the the time course analysis was performed using the human type uh, 4 phosphodiesters incubated with 10 nanomolar cyclic AMP at 30 degrees Celsius. The reaction was stopped at time intervals by the addition of a 1 milligram of undevertised YSI SPA beads in 6 millimolar zinc sulfate. So you can actually be able to use the capture product capture assays where you are actually going to have the substrate which is actually getting converted into the product and then you can actually be able to add the antibodies and you can actually be able to add the SPA beads and they saw you are actually going to see a signal and when you add the SPA beads it is actually going to terminate the signal and that's how you are actually going to see a signal right and using this signal you can be able to calculate the kinetics of the enzyme assays you can be able to calculate the uh, product, the concentration of the products and you can be able to calculate the other kinetic uh, parameters as well. Then we have the assay design. So important, there are important factor what you are going to consider when you are going to design the SPA based uh, non radiometric assays. First is source of the enzyme, the second is design of the substrate, then you are going to decide whether 
you want to use the signal increase or the decrease assay which means whether you are going to signal increase means you are actually going to say whether the it is easy to measure the product or signal decrease means it is whether it is easy to uh, measure the substrate then you whether you want to make the on beat or the off beat which means whether you want to uh, capture the uh, on signal or the off signal then you also going to have the optimization of the incubation concentrations then you are actually going to have the selection of the uh, different types of spa beats and then you can also have the optimization of the amount of spa beats what you are going to use for every reactions and then you also going to have the performance criteria and the validation of the spss then we have the solid phase versus solution phase sp enzyme assays so so far what we were discussing we were discussing about the solution phase uh, sp assays where you are actually adding the sp beats and that's how you are actually going to collect the cap signal from the sp beats and you can convert that into the uh, signal and that's how you are going to convert that into the concentration of the substrate or the product but you can also use the solid phase spa enzyme assays so the substrate is immobilized onto a surface in this case the spa beads is a, in a solid phase enzyme assays the enzyme is then free to work on the immobilized substrate this format for as a design raises several points first the process can no longer be assumed to follow the micro quantum kinetics for a variety of reasons the most important of which that enzyme and substrates are effectively compatible compatibilized from one another okay so there are many issues when you are going to do the solid phase spa assays because it is uh, not giving the free movement of the substrate and that's why they will not be able to follow the micro quantum kinetics the substrate is concentrated at the bead surface which is occupied a finite constant and especially a small volume in a assay tube the enzyme on the other hand is assumed to be evenly distributed throughout the assay tube as a result the significant amount of enzyme will not be able to used in the reactions right this means it is actually not going to give you the real uh, picture of how you are going to use the uh, you know the enzyme assays or the measuring the enzyme activity it is also necessary to consider how the presence of the bead surface affects the kinetics uh, interaction of the beads with the substrate and the enzyme must be characterized to study the kinetics of the enzyme at non saturating enzyme substrate concentration the time course of the solid phase assay can be faster at a given quantity of substrate as all the substrate is concentrated at the bead surface and therefore the localized concentration is relatively high so in this case one of the major drawback of the solid phase is is that the substrate is not evenly distributed it's very concentrated so the initial rate of reactions are going to be very fast because the substrate concentration is very high but the later on it is actually going to be very low because the substrate is uh, the concentration is going to be very low because it's already been consumed right so you are actually not going to get the equilibrium state actually the solid state format provides a fast simple and reliable assays for the drug screening enzyme measurements or the purification using the less substrate so one of the major advantage of the solid phase assay is that you are not going to lose the assay you are not going to lose the substrate so you can be able to reuse those beads again and again because they are immobilized onto the surface so you can be able to even measure the activity we can be able to reuse actually the same thing again and again then the solid phase assay once validated can be optimized to detect the inhibitor or more relative relative rates of the enzyme assays however not all enzyme perform well in solid phase spa test this could be done due to this this could be due to the active sites shape or the sites of the substrate used so this is very important because not all the enzymes are going to accept the substrate which is captured onto a particular uh, solid support because it is possible that the region what you have used for uh, you know linking to the solid support may be very crucial for the enzyme to recognize the substrate may not be for catalysis but for recognition of the substrate or binding of the substrate and that's why the 
some of the enzymes are relaxed some of the enzymes are flexible so they will be able to use but not for all solid phase sp assays in a solid phase assay all of the reaction components are present in solution right and the reaction can proceed in the absence of spa peat when the reaction has reached the desired level of substrate conversion the assay is terminated in the presence of spa peat the product are then collected and the reaction rate can be calculated this format eliminates the concern associated with the bead interference because the beads have a limited ability to bind the biotin the assay must be designed with either an excess of bead or the known amount of bead to capture a constant proportion of the product so this is a very very important point that you should have the enough amount of bead so that you should be able to capture all the substrate or the product so that you should be able to give the real representation of the concentration of the substrate at that particular moment if there will be a shortage of the beads then the substrate actual substrate concentration is going to be very high but the uh, relative uh, but the observation what you going to get from the reactions are going to be on a lower side so examples uh, there are so many enzymes what you can actually be able to use uh, or what you can actually be able to use for enzyme assays you can use the hiv integrase hiv protease hiv2 protease cmv protease uh, endothelin converting enzyme and so on so these are the some of the enzymes for which people have already developed the spa based uh, enzyme assays for example you can have the kinase assay so kinase are protein kinase are a type of enzyme that transfer the phosphate group to a specific protein recognizes the sequence thereby regulating their function these enzymes are involved in a wide range of cellular processes including cell growth differentiation inflammations and are classified based on the functional property and cell location these cellular mechanisms are crucial target for the peptic innovations so for example this is the target protein on you which is going to be recognized by the kinase and uh, it actually has a free oh group so what will happen is when you have the protein kinase it is going to take it this as a target and it is actually going to have the radio labeled uh, phosphate group right so in the, this is the gamma phosphate this is the beta phosphate and this is the alpha phosphate sorry alpha phosphate right and this gamma phosphate is actually going to be you know broken down from here and it is actually going to be transferred onto this oh and that's how you are actually going to have the o phosphate right and that's why this is actually going to be the phosphorylated product right so phosphorylated protein now if you have the scintillation beads right the scintillation beads are actually going to receive the beta particles and that's how they were actually going to give you the lights they are going to give you the lights and that's how you can be able to use that for example is you can actually do the imaging of the map kinases right you can actually be able to use this and you can be able to do the imaging of the map kinases so the reaction mixture contain the 50 picomol bitrinylated mbp so mbp is a protein the maltose binding protein you can actually have the radio labeled atp so you see the this is a radio labeled atp where you have the phosphate onto the gamma phosphate then you can have 25 picomol unlabeled atp and 25 microgram arc kinase so this is the kinase what you are going to use in a mox buffer right and uh, you can have the stratosporine dissolved in dmso was added to assay to convert the range and assay was performed in 384 plates and the action volume was 30 microliter as assay was incubated at 37 degrees celsius for 30 minutes and all that and then you are actually going to measure the activity so in the experimental design what you are going to do is you are actually going to do the amount of first put into the designing and optimizing the key parameter that influence the enzyme rates and their measurement determine the robustness of any assay right substrate concentrations and the purity reaction volume and in case of radiometric assays the radio label selection and optimal specific activity all of these factor must be careful considered carefully so when you are want to perform the radiometric assays you have to design the experimenter very nicely so that you can be able to reduce the background of the reactions and you can also be able to 
uh, you know, choose the different types of radiometric assays, uh, radio labels, whether you want to use the tritium labeled or carbon 14 or any other molecules, right? Uh, sulfur, right? And then you are going to use the technology, what technology you are going to use, whether you are going to use the microplate technology or uh, and ideally people are going to use the uh, hydrofoot screening assays. So, we can actually be able to use the radio labeled techniques for the microplate technologies. Uh, then you can also use see whether what kind of measurement techniques are available in your laboratory. So that also will going to decide which, what kind of radionic, um, radiometric assays you want to use. So you can actually be able to use the micro beta which employs the dual photomultiplier PMTs and the classical uh, coincidence counter and the top count with a single PMT and a time resolved counting approach can be used to determine the beta particle level such as tritium level, sulfur, calcium, uh, carbon, phosphorus or the uh, in, a central, in a conventional scintillation counting and as well as the 125i when used with the SPA. These instruments can be purchased with a variety of detector versions allowing the sample in a complete 384 well plate to be counted in approximately 45 minutes depending on the desired sample throughout. Then you can also be able to because the radiometric assays just require the incubation setting of the reactions and then you can actually be able to have some kind of separation technique so that you can be able to separate the radio labeled substrate from the normal substrate or radio labeled substrate from the product. And then you can be able to just have the technique to measure, right? So that's how you can actually be able to think about the automation of the assays. So the need to assay more sample will grow significantly in the pharmaceutical industries, particularly during the early stage of development. It is not surprising then that the much attention has been focused in the recent year on the improving the productivity of cost efficiency by the automatic or semi-automatic radiometric assays in the 96 and the 384 microplate formats. Then you can have the homogeneous radiometric assays such as the scintillation proximity assay can be automated using the wide range of commercially available robotic systems. So this is all about the radiometric assays. What we have discussed, we have discussed about how, what are the different way in which you can be able to set up the radiometric assays and how uh, you can be able to utilize or exploit the scintillation proximity assay based system to measure the activity of the enzyme without even going through the tedious process of separating the substrate or the radio label product. So this is all about the radiometric assays. Let's now move on to the another approach where you are actually going to use the gel electrophoresis. So the gel electrophoresis is a another approach where you are actually going to run the enzyme onto the electrophoresis or you are actually going to use the electrophoresis to separate the labeled substrate from the non-labeled substrate or labeled product from the unlabeled product. So enzyme assays after the electrophoresis. So after electrophoresis enzyme visualization consists of five stages. Stage 1, preparation of crude enzyme extracts, then you require the electrophoresis, you can have the enzyme visualizations, documentation and data interpretations. While the different electrophoretic method may produce similar separation pattern, the enzyme extraction from a biological source require the special considerations. So let's discuss the first step. First step is the preparation of the enzyme extract. So the extract of the microorganisms, all of these techniques or all of these approaches we have already discussed when we were discussing about the extraction of the enzyme from the different host. Uh, so you can actually we have the rupture of the microbial um, uh, microorganism protocol. So you can use the different types of protease inhibitor so that there should be no degradation of the enzyme and, and then you can use the extraction buffers and then you can also use the uh, procedures and that's how you can actually be able to prepare the extract of the microorganisms. 
if it is an animal or the uh, soft tissue to accept in case of very small animals a uh, specific organ should be used to enzyme extractions if possible use the fresh material otherwise tissue block should be stored at 80 degrees before storing the vascular system or organ should be cleaned with the 1.8% saline then you can also be able to have the processing of the mammalian bloods so preparation of the mammalian blood serum protocol so you can actually be able to follow the same protocol this protocol we have already discussed when we were discussing about how you can be able to prepare the serum right when we were discussing about how to produce the antibodies and uh, the lastly we have a plant tissues right so uh, plant seeds vegetables buds and cambium are the most free of protein interfering substance and thus preferentially used for enzyme source these tissues can be extracted using simple acid buffer or a neutral buffer right so 100 millimolar ps7 such buffer can be used to use for herbs right so small plants right that are low in phenol such as spinach or the pt then you can use the phosphate buffer frequently to retain the catalytic ability of the enzyme better than the tris right so as far as the buffer is concerned you should always try to use the physiological buffer such as phosphate buffer rather than the chemical buffer like tris and uh, phosphate buffer on the other hand should be avoided uh, when studying the metal ion dependent enzymes and phosphate buffers are also should be avoided when you are trying to measure the activity of the kinases uh, most plants store significant amount of phenolics in the vacuoles of their leaves and roots while having low protein content so terpenoids and resins resin acids are also commonly stored unless protective agents are added to the extraction medium when these compounds are released during homogenization they denature the intrinsic protein so that's why we should be very very careful from the phenolics and tannins and all other kinds of secondary metabolites from the plants so we should have a sufficient amount of the antioxidant molecules and the uh, reducing agents so that we should not they should not be able to affect the proteins now once you prepare the extract you can actually be able to run them onto the electrophoresis and then you can actually be able to do the different types of visualization techniques so principle of enzyme visualization so the basic idea behind the in situ protein isolation is to expose an enzyme to a solution containing the enzyme specific substrate the enzyme is demonstrated when its catalytic action on the substrate result in a color reaction product however the primary reaction products are frequently colorless and require coupling with a visualization agent to produce a colored product there are methods to visualize the oxidative enzymes for example dehydrogenases can be measured in two ways by measuring the change in the fluorescence of pyridine nucleotide nadph or nadh involved in the reaction or by visualization of the oxidation reaction using a tetrazoleum site that turns colored when reduced so you can actually be able to use either of these method to measure or to monitor the dehydrogenases that are present in the in, um, in the gel either you can use the fluorescent method to measure to see how the nadh or nadph is getting reduced or you can be able to see whether uh, you know you can actually run the enzymes you can perform the reactions and then you can be able to use the tetrazoleum salt for example you can use the mtt and uh, that actually is going to give you the blue color wherever it is actually going to find the enzyme which is of the dehydrogenases uh, so oxidative reductive catalytic reaction according to the general equation is that it is going to take the substrate plus acceptor for hydrogen and then it is actually going to give you the product plus acceptor which contains the hydrogen and then this process it is actually going to uh, process the mtt and that's how it is actually going to give you the color a co substrate o2 or an artificial indicator molecule can be used as an hydrogen acceptor oxidative that transfer the hydrogen to oxygen are referred as oxidases whereas those who reduce a pyridine nucleotide coenzymes are referred to as dehydrogenases it the dehydrogenases to be visualized in vitro the staining system must include a hydrogen transferring substance 
Then we have the PMS that uh, uh, is the most commonly used uh, sub, uh, substrate. And PMS has the ability to accept the hydrogen from the NAD plus and transfer it to a tetragonium salt. Then we have the uh, this kind of system where you have the substrate and hydrogen and it is actually going to product get converted into the substrate and this hydrogen is going to be received or accept by the uh, reactive side uh, reaction side NAD plus and that in terms is going to oxidize the PMS and uh, while the PMS is going to receive this uh, hydrogen it is actually going to give that hydrogen back to the tetrazoleum salt and that is how the tetrazoleum salts are going to be get converted into the reduced form and the reduced tetrazoleum is actually going to give you the color. Then we can have the assay of oxidases. So, the determination of oxidases and peroxidases is frequently being carried out using the 3 amino 9 and 3 carboxyl as an electron donor. But the reagent should be used with caution because it has been shown in animal tested to be non carcinogenic. Then you can use the 3355 tetramethyl benzidine, has been recommended as a substrate for. Uh, so, this is called also short form, it is called as TMB, right. And the addition of the peroxidases and a chromogenic hydrogen donor such as 3 amino 9 methyl carboxyl can be used to visualize the enzyme reaction in which the H2O2 is liberated. So, this is a carboxyl method where you can actually have the carboxyl which is a yellow colored product and uh, it is getting converted by accepting the hydrogen after the reactions and then when the peroxidases are converting the hydrogen peroxide into the water they are actually taking up this molecule and that is how it is converting a yellow colored carbazole into a brown colored carbazole and these brown colored carbazole can be visualized. Then we have the methods to visualize the hydrolysis, right. So, hydrolysis are the enzymes that catalyze the hydrolytic cleavage of CO, CN, CC and all other kinds of bonds including the phosphoric anhydric bonds. So, the more the well known method for detecting the hydrotic enzymes are the use of substrate that produces a fluorescent compound when enzymatically hydrolyzed and the use of naphthol derivative and substrate and coupling the enzyme hydrolyzed naphthol to a diazonium compound to produce a colored di diazo dyes. The umbiliferon methods to detect the hydrolysis, this, this is the method what I have given to uh, to measure or to detect the activity of the hydrolysis and uh, the, he, here what you are going to do is you are going to have the substrate when it is being cleaved it is actually going to uh, be uh, you know be fluorescent and that is how you can be able to measure the fluorescence. So, uh, Then you can have the azo coupling method to detect the hydrolysis. So, as the substrate for azo coupling derivative of alpha or beta naphthols are used during enzymatic hydrolysis, the corresponding acid or amide or naphthol compound is liberated. The non colored naphthol compound is non enzymatically bound to a diazonium salt via the azo coupling process. The basic structure of diazonium salt is RNR, right which confers color upon the formation to uh, azo groups. The color of azo dye is determined by both the diazonium salt used and the compound to which it is coupled. Coupling of naphthol derivative to diazonium salt can be performed by the two methods. The diazonium salt is directly included in the test reaction or it is added after the sufficient alpha or beta naphthol has formed. So, these are the different types of assays where which can be used by the uh, you know the electrophoresis and then we have the staining protocol. So, once you have the staining protocol for the acid phosphatases, uh, so you can have the equipments and the reactions right. So, you can have the star gel, you can have the dye which is called fast blue, brovnar blue, then you can have the citrate buffers, alpha nucleine phosphate and acetones. So, in this assay what you are going to do is you are going to run the reactions and then you are going to do the staining protocol for the acid phosphatases. Uh, then you, what you are going to do is you are going to dissolve the 10 milligram of first garnet GBC 
salt in the 10 ml of citrate buffer pH 4.5 and add the 4 ml of orthonephthalene phosphate and you filter and drop on the cut surface of a processed starch gel. The appearance of blue band indicates the presence of an active enzyme. Note if the pH of the electrophoresis buffer is greater than the 7, incubate gel in the citrate buffer 30 minutes at 5 degrees Celsius before staining. Uh, electrophoresis, you are going to run the starch gel with a pH 7 and 13 volt per centimeter 5 hours at 4 degrees Celsius. Then you can also use the uh, measuring uh, protein kinase assays. So remember that the protein kinase assay is actually going to do this, right? It is actually going to take the protein. Then you are actually going to add the ATP. So ATP is actually going to have the radio label, right? Or it is actually going to have the gamma phosphate, right? And then what will happen is that the protein is getting converted into a phosphate which is actually going to impart. So, this is actually going to be either positively charged or neutral whereas this is actually going to be negatively charged because it is actually going to have the phosphate group, right. So, this negatively charged group is going to run towards the different side whereas the positively charged group is going to run on the other side. So, during a kinase assay, the protein kinase transfer a phosphate group from ATP to the substrate and impart a negative charge onto the substrate molecule. In the protein kinase assay, a peptide with, positive, with a net plus one charge is incubated in the assay buffer containing enzyme non-radioactive ATP. A controlled reaction is also performed where the enzyme is removed from the assay mixture. Both experimental and controlled reactions are loaded in the middle of the agarose gel. So, the peptide present in the control reaction has the plus positive charge and it will migrate towards the negative electrode. Whereas, the peptide in the experimental reaction has the net minus charge and it will migrate towards the positive electrode. The assay gives the qualitative or semi-quantitative information about the protein kinase assay. But this assay can be used for test different compound different to know where the optimal sequence of the substrate. The assay is easy to perform and it does not require any specialized equipment. So, this is what you are going to do is you are going to take the peptide which is actually going to have the net positive charge and because it has a positive charge it will run towards the negative electrodes whereas when it is getting phosphorylated with the help of the phosphate group from the ATP the peptide is going to have the net negative charge so it is actually going to have the minus 1 charge and because it has a minus 1 charge, it will run in the different directions, right. So, you are going to run the two reactions. One is you are going to run the control reaction, the second is you are going to run the experimental reaction. So, in the control reaction, you are going to have the peptide plus ATP, right. So, there will be no transfer of phosphate group from the ATP to the peptide and that is why it is the peptide is going to remain as plus 1. Whereas, in the experimental reaction, you are going to have the peptide plus ATP and with the enzyme, right. So, you are going to have the enzyme. So, because you have the enzyme, there will be a transfer of the phosphate group from the ATP and that is why here, the you are going to have the minus 1 charge. And then what you are going to do is, you are going to load these two in the middle of the agarose gel, right. So, what will happen is that the control reaction which is actually going to have the positively charged peptide molecule will run towards the negative electrodes whereas the peptide which is from the experimental conditions is going to have the phosphate group, right. So, it is actually going to have the minus 1 charge and because of that it is actually going to run in this direction. And amount of peptide which is going to be migrated towards this side versus the amount of my amount by uh, peptide which will migrate towards this side because from this reaction it will not be 100 percent. So, imagine that you have the 70 percent uh, phosphorylations, 30 percent non phosphorylation. So, non phosphorylated peptide will run in this direction whereas the phosphorylated peptide will run in this direction. So, if you measure the activity or if you measure the intensity of these bands which are you are going to get on both the side, you can be able to calculate the activity of the particular protein kinase assays. 
So this is all about the enzyme assays, how you can be able to set up the different types of enzyme assays utilizing the different properties of the substrate or the product. So you can actually be able to use the photometric based assays where you are going to see how the substrates or the products are absorbing the lights. And then you can also be able to use the radiometric assays where you are going to use the radioactive uh, molecules or the nuclei and that's how you are going to measure the activity of the kinases, transferases and hydrolases. And lastly, we have also discussed about the electrophoretic method where you can actually be able to run the enzyme onto the electrophoretic gels and then you can actually be have the different types of staining methods to stain the uh, substrate or the product or sometimes you can also be able to have the flexibility of staining the cofactors and that's how you can be able to identify the different types of substrates. So with this I would like to conclude my lecture here. In our subsequent lecture we are going to discuss some more aspects related to enzymes. Thank you. Mm -hmm.